Well, hello, I'm, I'm Dr. Kaylee Doak. I'm here representing the University of Colorado and the Virtual Visiting Professor Network. We also have Dr. Brian Kavanaugh here too. Um, so we're excited to partner with Rover today to bring you the second annual Bruno Lecture of Radiation Oncology. Um, so we're coming to you live today from the University of Colorado Medical Campus. And we have Dr. Sue Young here. Previously, we've come to you virtually, but now we're all physically located in the same room. So we're um, excited to hear from her today about the exciting and fantastic future of head and neck cancer. So um, a brief introduction here. Dr. Suyam is the Erwin Mark Jacobs and Joan Klein Jacobs Distinguished Professor in Head and Neck Cancer Radiation Oncology and Professor in the Department of Radiation Oncology and Head and Neck Surgery. She earned her medical degree and PhD in English from the University of Pennsylvania in 2002 and completed residency at MD Anderson before joining the faculty at the University of California School of Medicine in 2007. During her assistant professorship, she completed a master's in clinical research, and her clinical practice and academic areas of interest include head and neck and skin cancers as well. She serves as vice chair for the Strategic Advisory Committee and as chief of the Radiation Oncology Head and Neck Cutaneous and Thoracic Services. At the national level, level she's the editor in chief of the Red Journal, chair of the Energy Oncology Head and Neck Cancer Committee, uh, and board member of the Guidelines and Protocols Committee, co chair for the Head and Neck Cancer International Group. And she's a member of the NCCN uh, Guidelines Committee for Head and Neck Cancers. Her research interests include clinical trials, novel imaging, quality of life and decision uh, support, smoking cessation, and the oral microbiome. And she's the PI of several NRG uh, trials looking at reduced intensity therapy for HPV associated or pharyngeal cancers, and co PI of NRG HN001 looking at risk adapted therapy for EPV associated nasopharyngeal cancers. So, um, without further ado, here is Dr. Young. Hello. I, oh, I can see my phone. That's well. That is distracting. Um, one of the number of reasons why virtual meetings are exhausting, I learned this in an article I read online, I think it was in uh, Vogue. Uh, was about the fact that most people want to look at themselves. And when you look at yourself, you don't blink. When you look at your own image, you blink less. And that's actually very fatiguing. And I keep sharing this with people and no one actually uh, has heard that before, but it's a very, uh, I think I think it's a very relevant fact. So I try actually not to look at myself and this will make it even easier because I will just stare at this little camera. Um, hello. hello, I'm here in University of Colorado Garb, but I just want you to know that this was given to me, so no rumors. And yes, I'm visiting today and really thrilled. Had a wonderful afternoon with the residents. We talked about all manner of things <laughs> <laughs> under, under, um, yeah, under uh, a sealed, uh, sealed, um, in a sealed room. That's right. Okay. That, that conversation, that com whole conversation is sealed forever. Um, and today, uh, I have a picture of. Uh, the very first cover-up that we published when I became editor at the Red Journal, and the reason I have it is not because we're going to absolutely not going to talk about the Red Journal very much, but maybe a little bit, yeah, but not much, um, but because I just love that picture, and I had no idea when I put it on the cover um, in uh, January of 2021 uh, how much that cover would start to speak to me about, like, many things in my life which are just that, that there's such a long road ahead and it's an endless road and there's so many horizons. And I think radiation oncology, generally speaking, um, has, has such a fascinating history, has such a head of it, head and neck cancer as well. And the more you get into something and you love it more, and more the more you start to think about that sweep and where things are going and how exciting the future can be. And I never kind of thought about all that when I put that picture of, the unfortunately named Death Valley on the cover, but <laughs> but when I look at the image itself, it does speak to me a lot about, about that. So we will talk about a lot of things that I think many of you have heard before, but perhaps um, more from that futuristic perspective a little bit. So how do I enhance this? Touch, touch that, touch the button on it. Yeah. 
Did it work? Oh, yeah. hey, I have no idea if this is for CME or not, but if it is for CME, it's now official and you've seen all my disclosures. So everything that is not grayed out is commercial and current. Things that are grayed out are either non-commercial um, or no longer active. And this is the past five years, including all the um, kind of sunshine and reporting as well. So this is a book that I read a really long time ago. And when I was thinking about putting this together, I thought mega trends. And you know, the book itself is okay. And if you ever want to read it, it is actually kind of interesting, although maybe it's becoming a passe. I think they have a new one out now called the new mega trends or something like that. But um Mega trends, you know, are, um, are sort of these large scale changes. They aren't they aren't direct changes, but they're underlying things that change the direction of where we're going. And that's what I think we can say about headache cancer is, you know, you might look at <laughs> um, what we're doing in headache cancer now, and it really is not that different than what we were doing in 2010. So in terms of actual micro direction and what you might call advances, you know, it's not like medical oncology where we get something new at every ASCO. Um, you know, we're still doing a lot of what we're doing, but what are the, um, you know, what are the things that are shaping the field and changing how we treat our patients? Those underlying things to me are very, very interesting. So let's want to talk to you a little bit about that. So one of those things is smoking, and this is kind of obvious, but we're going to uh, talk about a little bit more of the implications of this you know, smoking has dramatically increased, and we really feel this in my state at home in California, um, where they're practically, um, you know, almost a disappearing breed. I mean, I think uh, the last time we took the census of our cancer center, it was like 10 or 11% were actually you know, had a recent history of smoking. So it's very low, at least in certain areas of the country. And meanwhile, what that has uncovered, and I'm not going to say has changed to, because we really don't know what HPV was doing out there in the population people were smoking because it wasn't looked at and it was kind of covered up. Um, but what we know now um, with, with, uh, with more study of this is that oral HPV DNA prevalence in the oral cavity probably runs somewhere like six or seven percent of the population at any given time. Now the interesting thing is that most people will clear their HPV after some time. So if you look at for instance college students who seem to be rampantly infected with HPV um, the vast majority of them, say six months later, will will have cleared that HPV infection. But in some cases, it becomes persistent um, or chronic or repeated infections, and that's when you have a higher chance for the integration and subsequent um, introduction of cancer. Um, and that is also why in the original studies on HPV, an increased number of sexual partners was associated with infection and with increased cancer risk. And does anybody know who that person is up in the corner? So that is a very famous actress uh, who was the star of Deep Throat, and <laughs> this, this actress um, became really well known because she, so, um, she was so, um, um, she had such notoriety at the time. And this was a film, I wasn't around at that time, and I also wasn't, um, I wasn't in high school at the time, so boy. And so I did not experience this, but from what I understand, and I have confirmed this with some personal acquaintances, this was a film that was circulated so widely um, uh, as it's almost a uh, must see kind of film and educated an entire generation of people, of Americans, in, in how to perform um, oral sex practices and really is a cultural watershed moment. And I will just say that in the Bay Area, we see that very distinctly. Um, you've all heard about the 60s and what happened and um, you know the, the sort of free love movement. And so what that really has, uh, what that really changed from very traditional sexual practices to quite a variety of sexual practices, not just in select populations, but across the country. And, um, and this has, you know, obviously facilitated the spread of oral HPV. And that is why we are seeing changes now in the demographics of um, HPV transmitted disease. Whereas before, I think the one, the disease where HPV has been studied and where it was the most important was the cervical tract. And now, um, as you can see, even from this really relatively old now pie chart, oropharynx cancer has really become a very dominant HPV cancer in the United States. And um, particularly in men, it is clearly the dominant one. It, over, it overtook cervix cancer about a decade ago and continues to be a prevalent 
at an increasing proportion of women. Um, so that is what has really changed um, the whole way we approach head and neck cancer um, research in the United States. And what's one of, one of the interesting sort of little trivias I'll share with you here is that I, I thought this was such an interesting picture because when I first started working and I would see these patients who had double HPV infections, double HPV cancers, and that is very possible. There's a small percentage of patients that actually has two cancers that are both HPV related. I noticed that the cervical and anal cancers were occurring uh, earlier and the oropharynx cancers were occurring later. And there are, this actually has been documented out. So HPV, you're introduced to initial potential for infection at your sexual debut. And for some reason, it's not clear why, whether it's some sort of drift, genetic drift effect, or some sort of um, change in sexual practices that happens as you age, um, maybe both. Um, the, the peak time of infection for cervical cancer is much earlier and the peak time for infection for oropharynx cancers later. But you can see in both cases, the actual pattern of cancer development is very similar, which takes place over decades later. And so many of you know this, you start to see those cancers later in life, but that's why you see often the first HPV cancer, let's say in a younger woman, and then much later in life, she, say decades later, she may develop oropharynx cancer. But the oropharynx cancer is usually the last. And as you can see, the rates of oropharynx cancer are rising, whereas the rates of other head and neck cancers that are traditionally smoking later are going down. And that's a mega trend that's really changing how people think about practice. And it is interesting because historically, the way we treat oropharynx cancer is the way we've always treated all of head and neck cancer. Oropharynx has been like testing ground, the standard by which we learn how to treat all cancers. And because that is changing, our practice is changing. And many of you, I'm sure, already know this from OTG0129, which was a negative trial. You could call it a failed trial. It wasn't shown that accelerated radiation helped in the setting of concurrent chemotherapy. And we know that not only from OTG, but also from Cortec, which was in the time. But what was important was that they actually did not publish the primary analysis of the trial itself. What they published was a translational post hoc analysis, unplanned, but conducted later because they realized that HPV was such an important driver in this trial. Basically washed out any potential statistical plan that this trial would have had, as well as <laughs> two subsequent other ones. And so when HPV comes in, you have to remember that the statistics for the trial were developed off a certain base. That's how the NRG always develops its trials, goes back to history, makes its statistical projections. And then HPV comes in and changes the prognosis for the entire population raising all boats. You can't get that. You can't get that statistical plan. You can't find that significant advantage. So that's what happened in this trial. They realized that, and this led to the publication of this translation on that. Um, and many of you are familiar with this RPA, which basically shows that if you're HPV positive, tested with P16 or HPV at the time, and you're a non smoker, you automatically get classified into the lowest risk for death versus the alternative. And um, with some variations in lower end stage or higher T stage, so the intermediate risk category. And then I'm sure you've all seen this very famous plot, which shows you the dramatic differences that HPV made in this trial, which outweighed any other factors such as the inter-experimental intervention. And there's been a second analysis, of course, that was published uh, using um, this the same trials with another one where they showed that not only does HPV remain prognostic at the initial treatment, but also remains prognostic at salvage if you have surgery, if you have distant meds, um, uh, the, the HPV remains prognostic throughout. And these two graphs became super important because what everyone realized was that we could no longer run clinical trials that did not account for the impact of this factor. That it, not even just in the local region space, but also in the current space and the distant metastatic space, that this is such a powerful factor in every stage of the disease progression. And then I'm sure many of you, again, know that the ICON uh, project um, basically looked at the staging system. So the importance of staging is you want to get those four curves. So when you go to the boards, right, this will always work for you. <laughs> If they ask you, you know, what, what's your projection for this patient, you can, if you can get the patient into a stage one, two, three, four, remember that the staging system is designed, is always designed to separate those four stages the best that they can. 
you always want discrimination. So, you know, generally speaking, you can say, okay, uh, 25%, 40%, 65%, 90%, and it will often work. You'll be within 10%. Okay, if you can just get to get to that point, but you can see here in the old staging system, um, the P16 patients were not discriminating. Their curls were all clustering together, and it was just not working, right? And so this huge group came together, put together this giant collection of patients, and found that they could reclassify HPV-related oropharynx, get discrimination between at least three stages, and that is what grew into the new AGCC chapter when we revised it version eight, which many of you kind of use to stage P16 positive disease, right? And it's amazing. I mean, this is incredible. So you say things are exciting or fantastic. This is really incredible because we now can say to patients, you're not stage 4A. I mean, and it literally changed that month in January when the staging system was published. You're stage one. I had patients who were on treatment and their stage literally changed while they were treatment. And you just have to recognize how incredible that really is um, in terms of thought process, how we deal with our patients, what they think, how they perceive their treatment. Um, it's changed a lot about how we interact with patients now. And this is also incredible. So we went from one very incredible and also, I say that sarcastically, also really kind of a pain because we went from one very easy staging system and as is the want now with HACC, we went to four very complicated staging systems because we now have four staging systems for clinical and pathologic for P16 positive and P16 negative. And so, you know, all staging gets more complicated over time. That's the unfortunate grief. Um, and this is also an incredible thing because we now have incorporation of pathologic features with divergence of a totally different staging system that is taking place in parallel within the surgical community. And that again is a challenge and a little bit of a uh, difficulty, right? So we could go into the um, theory and the uh, problems that are created by uh, uh, by discordance now with the clinical and pathologic staging system, which is going to have to be worked out in the future. And this is incredible. So now, um, where we once used to just give chemo radiation kind of to all comers in a very standard manner, we have a complete dispersion across the category of HPV cancer with many different bases for treatment, including the traditional LT-based types of treatment, including multiple varieties of induction, and including, as I said, uh, surgery. And so again, this is incredible. Wonderful treatment to like what I put down for eight. Um, and those are just the major categories without all the variations and variations that, that come with but um, incredible and also very challenging, right? So these are the huge trends that we now are handling, which are this, this dramatic change, again, in how we talk to patients, how we deal with this, how, how they perceive their treatments. Um, right, uh, here. Yay, okay. <laughs> But if you want to say like what's changing practice, these are the things that have changed in practice. And you notice that there are many um, maybes and very few is on this slide. So the one thing we know, which we talked about this morning, is cetuximab is inferior to cisplatin in the HPV orifarynx population. We literally know nothing else, okay? Despite all the hullabaloo and PR and the constant, you know, you know, um, throwaway journals that come to your box with things on the front page. We actually know very little. So we, we don't know any of these other things about the 60 gray viability in the current cumulation format, um, whether 1308, which is the accompanying induction, is really acceptable, whether post-op RT of 50 gray is truly equivalent, whether surgical therapy can be an option. We don't know a lot of things. We do know that HPV positive disease is probably more radiosensitive. This is one interpretation, one lab. And I'll just say there's a lot of complicated explanations uh, that were published subsequent to this about why it's more radiosensitive. But I think, I think most people accept that it does, at least in a laboratory or translational setting, seem to be more radiation sensitive. And that's why the NRG initiated this trial, which 
I helped organize, trying to look at whether sixty gray was an acceptable option. And why did we do this? I mean, it's an interesting thing philosophically when you think back about it, because um, patients actually do extremely well with 70 gray and cisplatin, really, really well. And if you look at their short-term quality of life, the vast majority of our data indicates that they recover their quality of life at about one year, very close to their baseline. Um, but there is this concern at about maybe nine to 11 years that people were starting to see things happen in these patients that were not so great. Um, important to put some caveats around that. If you've been in practice long enough, you know that those things that happen in nine to 11 years are happening in the patients who've had larger size disease. Um, you also know that it's a relatively, you know, relative minority of the patients um, in the best series that exist, of which there are scarce, very few, you can literally count them on half of one hand. Maybe it's something like eight to 15% of those patients, but the vast majority do not experience those severe complications. So a lot of, um, uh, I would call it public push for de-escalation uh, without really clear evidence in place exactly why we're de-escalating. And so I think that's really something to think about carefully whenever we talk about any de-intensification right now. But we ran this trial. And actually it turned out that this is platinum with radiation 60 gray did pretty well. The PFS was actually equivalent um, looking. Um, remember, this was a phase two um, parallel arms like winter type situation. So there wasn't a direct comparison uh, and there was no control arm, but we did show that the PFS was comparable to historical internal R2G standard. And what's really interesting and here, I do want to say this, is that the MDATI, which is swallowing quality of life index, was incredible that one year. Um, we have to say that you know usually the boundary for MDATI is around 60 for acceptability, and so to see an MDATI up in the high 80s um, at one year is really outstanding, and that caught a lot of attention. Confirms that at least in the acute short term, these patients do seem to be doing really well um, on a reduced dose. Of Important to talk a little bit about um, why that might be. So another misconception about this trial is that it was because we de-escalated the dose to 60 gray. And there's been, um, I would call this kind of a, a, a maybe a mega trend that took over for a little while, which was dose de-escalation, reducing the dose, how far can we reduce the dose, um, just like lymphoma. And the, you know, I, I really um, want to just point out that 60 gray is a really simplistic way to talk about this treatment or this trial. This was, um, as we spoke about this morning, a simultaneous integrated boost plan with overlapping PTBs and the elective doses were being treated at a very low dose per fraction in uh, SIV at 1.6 gray per fraction to 48. So it becomes an interesting question, which is, did the patients seem to experience quality of life because we reduced the main dose or did they experience quality of life because dose per fraction and the overall delivered dose of the elective region were lower. A lot of people are like, well, how could you just do that? Will it reduce the elective dose down that low? Because when you really look at 48 gray over 30 fractions, right? That's not 48 gray, that's even lower. That's something in the low 40s. Um, we had to do it because how could you treat the main dose to six, main dose to 60 and then have like, you know, I mean, what were you going to treat to the to the intermediate and low regions when you already were at 60? So we had to lower it to make any sense. But it's an interesting thing in retrospect. And then, of course, in HN002, um, for the first time ever in a national trial, we defined uh, conditions for ipsilateral radiation and strongly encouraged people to do that for a tonsil-confined primary system, which had never been encouraged before. Yeah. So a lot of point I'm making here is, um, is it about dose or is it about volume? And this is, I think, the beginning of where we see a second trend happening, which is the interest now or the realization now that volume matters as much as dose. So this is a really interesting trial that um, I think is close to completion in Canada, CCTG11. Um, this is called the Evader trial. It's a very simple single arm trial, but I think what's really, and, and to, to, in full disclosure, this came out of the preparations and discussions for HN005, which was the successor to HN002. Because in HN005, we actually wanted to drop dose and 
um, but we weren't allowed to do that um, to drop dose. So we, uh, the evader people took that forward and ran this study looking at retrieval options. You can see they're pretty different used for what you would usually do. And these are just some examples showing you again for different scenarios of dropping down the low neck and contra neck. And I would be really interested to see how that would uh, manifest because even though it's a single small trial, uh, the potential here for this uh, could, be, could be very transparent. And then if you want to talk about volume de-escalation, it's happening a lot of places now because I think this has become really interesting to people. Um, at the University of Texas Southwestern, this is a fascinating trial called Infield, where they started with 40 gray and 20 fractions just to um, a very confined area. So for ore fairings, that was the um, unilateral, bilateral, level two only, right? So the highest risk nodal area only. And then for larynx, it was bilateral levels two and three only. So really dropping a lot of we consider the traditional elective coverage. And then they took the um, the main uh, cancer up to the traditional dose. But what's really fascinating is that at two years, um, you know, and, and remember this is all commerce. This isn't just HPV positive. So raising the question of whether this is really an HPV phenomenon that we should be restricting to a good risk population, or whether the elective volume reduction question is a question that applies to all ethnic cancer. You can see here in this unselected population, the risk of solitary elective nodal failure was zero for those very constricted volumes. And for the patients who met criteria for NRG agent 002, their PFS was 90%. So the same as what we got in the trial with traditional elective coverage. So really interesting to me. Um, and now there are all these trials trying to do explicit volume reduction in different ways, either with induction chemotherapy followed by dramatic volume reduction, um, there's even a trial out there on post-op therapy, trying to reduce volume to the neck. Um, there's uh, a proton trial where they're trying to reduce volume to the site. Talk about all the complications of that. But, you know, volume now has become, I think, um, a much more um, or equally compelling question to dose. And then if you want to talk about very dramatic volume reduction, there's SBRT. So I'll, I don't have to repeat this for a Colorado audience, but all of you know about this very interesting trial that was published in Nature Cancer from the University of Colorado, which was trying to use a combination of Dervalumab and SBRT for HPV negative patients prior to their uh, surgery. And as you can see here, very impressive local control results, results at early follow-up, um, has raised a lot of intriguing questions about whether preoperative uh, Volume reduced SBRT is actually viable in a uh, newly diagnosed, what we call PULA, previously untreated local regionally advanced population and HPV negative. And then this is the other study, which is the um, contrary experience that we just published in the Red Journal, almost as an emergency communication out of UCLA. So this is HPV positive disease, and these patients got um, SBRT prior to, uh, as well as a complicated, uh, either uh, monotherapy immunotherapy or the Dublin immunotherapy prior to their um, surgery, their tours and their neck dissection. And unfortunately, this trial for various reasons was not successful. Um, they experienced many uh, local, local regional failures outside of the SBRT volumes and then ended up with a PFS of in the 70s, which is considered unacceptable in a good risk HPV population. And um, the authors actually uh, issued this publication almost, almost as a, a little bit of a, a cautionary note, which was that um, taking out elective volumes to this dramatic extent may not, may not be uh, viable at this time without further study. So, you know, what this points out is we have a lot of work to do on the role of HPV negative and HPV positivity in elective nodal uh, volume coverage. A lot more work to do um, thinking about this in rooms with other systemic treatment um, and whether we should be doing this in newly diagnosed population prior to surgery. 
But I just want to step back for a minute and say that the other thing that's very complicating, which a lot of people don't understand, is that we're no longer talking about one dose. And this is a this is a um, thing that I kind of try to um, emphasize to the surgical community because it seems to me like with the um, obsession with dose, there's a lot of discussion in tumor board now about what what dose are we giving to the patient? Are we giving you know, <laughs> and they want to know a number, like an actual number. Um, you know, and I, I've actually started to refuse to answer that question because I don't think it's a helpful answer. I don't think it, it, it actually doesn't matter. I could say anything. I could say 62.5 and everyone in the room would be like, oh, okay, that's, that sounds low. Does that help anyone? Does that help the patient? Does that help the other doctors who asked me? Does it say anything about what I'm actually doing? No, because 62.5, sure, there's going to be some 62.5 in there. Maybe at the hot spot in the middle of the tumor, if I'm treating to 60, maybe, you know, I don't know if I'm treating to 70. So, you know, where's the 62.5? Nobody knows. And so one of the things that is important um, for us as a community to explain to our, our co-disciplines is that radiation plans are really complex and that in the era of SIV, we're talking about a spectrum of dose and each patient will have an individualized spectrum dose. I'm showing examples here, right, of a patient where the larynx was totally spared and the larynx was not spared, same exact stage. And so there are actually some, some data on this. There's this one interesting paper, I like it because of the title, which is that, you know, by, by uh, a couple of investigators looking retrospectively at this, so not, not a very special paper in that sense, but what they talk about is that the spectrum of dose and volumes actually determine what your long-term uh, sequelae are going to be. And how do we analyze that? I don't know. You know, that's going to be very complicated to translate into the simplistic terms that make the headlines, but it probably is going to involve some AI. Uh, I don't like bringing that up because that sounds so vague, but, you know, AI, more complicated um, ways of calculating dose to critical structures. All right, so go back to the story. So HN005 is still running. Um, many of you know we issued uh, a, a, a notice that the futility analysis had been triggered from R2. The futility analysis showed that the hazard ratio was too high to continue R2, so that arm has actually been discontinued. And to what I will say again is great public surprise, arm three remains not triggered. So the trial is still working with that are pretty intense in the regimen, additional regimen, TOG1016, the winning arm, uh, versus um, 60 gray with nivolumab, which was intended to be experimental in the phase two. So the phase two is going to close down pretty soon, and then we'll be able to see what, um, what those two arms look like. Um, we'll probably know uh, sometime this year whether the trial will continue on into a planned phase three, comparing those two arms, or whether the trial will... Uh, will end. But, you know, I'll say again, uh, this just goes to show you that nothing counts in the end except a randomized trial. Um, you just can't know until you do the, the randomized trial for trigger what's going to happen. And the other thing is that the error that the trial is run in is, is specific. So when you talk about trial results, I think this is something I've learned with experience now. The question that the trial is, is very specific time and the error that the trial is very specific and all that has to be understood to properly interpret the results of that trial. What happened between HN002 and HN005 was the introduction of TORS. So you have to take that into account and look at this, you know, were, were the patients in HN005 those who were considered unresectable? And why does that matter? Because what really matters now going forward um, and this is something I'm now trying to really emphasize at MMG to the best we can within our blunt instruments is selection um, and who goes into the trial. And this is this is really, you know, this is known for a long time that um, what you put in is what you get out in some cases. I think it's a really nice article that makes that old chestnut point, but makes it in a contemporary context from David Palma and the Orator Group which I'm sure all of you uh, know about them, um, they um, went back and looked at surgical resectability in and of itself as a differentiator intrastage. And they have a very nice appendix, which is fun to look at, where you can actually see the patients that were the same stage and those were resectable versus those who were not. And what they show is, um, at least in this retrospective analysis, huge differences in outcomes just based on from anatomic imaging. And that's not even taking into account medical comorbidities 
or other reasons for not being able to go to surgery, right? And here's another selection principle, which um, we could talk about, which is um, PROs. So I think the other thing that's happening, um, which we learned from the orator track, comparator track of surgery versus radiation-based treatment, is that PROs are really important. And that the way that we describe PROs, what we look at for PROs, how we balance those PROs um, against each other and over time is, is a whole science in and of itself that I'll be honest, I think the head and neck cancer world is not prepared to handle. Um, much better at it in the GU world. Um, not very good at this kind of decision-making process. And so that is something we're, we're gonna have to figure that part out. And it's really, really important to remember that, again, uh, randomized phase two data are valuable, single arm phase two data are valuable. Cross trial comparisons are really dangerous. And so a lot of people have said, well, you know, we should, you know, look at 3311 versus two versus what was in order and trying to figure that out. It's, it's really not. And I'll just point you here to the fact that you even just look at very blunt categorization about smoking or external extension, they were different across all of these trials. So again, making the point, I know it's painful, but the point that the trial question, the hypothesis is very specific and very narrow. The error in which the trial is run is critically important. And the differences between trials usually make it not comparable to other trials in a, in a simplistic fashion. So really important to keep that in mind. Um, here's another selection principle that's been put out there by Duke. They published this and they've been working on this and now have a prospective trial based on this data, which is looking at PET CT at simulation and then after two weeks at a dose of 20 gray. And they have some metrics where they think that they can get, uh, measure the SUV. Um, and decide whether the patient can be de-escalated or not. And this is, um, I find this interesting because this is one of a new series of trials that is looking at what I would call dynamic on treatment adaptation. And so one of the things about head and neck cancer, you know, <laughs> we had it really easy for a long time when we had parallel opposed fields. That was awesome. Then we went to IMRT, much more difficult. And you know, but still not so bad because once you got over the initial pain of making that IMRT plan, then you just kind of post for seven weeks, right? The patient sits there, they're getting their platinum, they're getting their radiation, you're checking in on them, making sure you're mostly doing medical support, but you're not actually changing that much. And we've done that now for a decade and a half with IMRT, right? Um, maybe it's time that we have to start thinking about what we do on treatment. I can't tell you the number of patients that ask me regularly. What are you gonna to do to check me during treatment? How do you know it's working, right? And, you know, that's the patient's voice speaking to us. So the other way is, you know, this very interesting study from Memorial Sloan Kettering where um, uh, Dr. Lee and her good colleagues uh, did, a, did a very interesting experiment where they um, removed, okay, so it's important to understand the details of the study. Okay, because it is actually a very highly ethical and responsible study. No patient was placed in danger because they all got triple modality therapy. So the primary is resected. They do an f miso pet. If the f miso pet has resolved at um, uh, repeat uh, administration of the f miso pet at, at uh, uh, about a week and a half later, then the patient is allowed with absence of f miso signal to go to 30 gray to the gross disease in the neck. They continue to get cisplatin concurrently with that. And the patient gets a neck dissection at the end to take the biomarkers out on the neck, right? So they did this and out of 19 patients, they were able to deescalate 15 to 30 gray. And out of that 15, 11, 73% have a CR. Just want to emphasize those are not great numbers when you look at them in the whole cold light of day. But but it's a lot of patients that got a path to the arm that is impressive and in the neck where the disease tends to be often more resistant. So there is something here. Um, is it ready for prime time? I'm not quite sure. We'll try to work, work through that um, with this group. Um, but certainly, again, really a fascinating attempt to adapt while in therapy. Um, and I'll just say, you know, the other thing, of course, if you can do these kind of sequencing things where you look at prognostic factors, um, and I'll put the ECOG version of their prognostic factors over there, which they're, they're interested in track, but the, um, 
you know, the problem with this is that this is also from baseline. Right? When you when you sequence tumors at the very beginning of treatment, that's a snapshot in time as well. And 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 my view is, you know, is that is that going to be eventually limiting as well? Because again, does this does this really move towards um, what I would call true adaptation, true true assessment and response? Um, it's prognostic. Will it ever become predictive? It hasn't yet. And that really raises questions for me and my client. And then, of course, we have these assays, which all of you know about because they come and visit everybody's department all the time and talk to you about HPV in the blood. So, you know, you can do this now, this di digital PCR assays, which are, which are much better than previous technology. And this was the uh, some of the initial data that came out of UNC, which um, uh, developed this assay. Showing that again, very, very prognostic if the CT DNA is recurring or persisting in the blood. Now, why is this fascinating? Because this is taking us forward into um, adaptation, the potential for adaptation. We did an analysis of this on our own data um, from HN002, which I present at ASCO. And as you can see here, uh, there is. Um, a little bit of a, a, an interesting note about this assay. It's a little bit more specific, perhaps for tumor modified HPV DNA. So it is separate from free floating um, infectious DNA, for example, or other types of DNA. So um, basically more specific to the tumor itself, although not um, bespoke. And anyway, uh, what we found um, in this unplanned post hoc. Well, I shouldn't say unplanned because we'd actually planned to do this, so we, we had the blood. So it was it was a planned analysis, um, but it wasn't necessarily uh, planned that we were going to use this specific assay. And that you know, there's many many assays out there, so you have to keep that in mind. But anyway, point is, um, we we had the blood. We had planned to do HPV DNA of some type. We did it using this assay, and what we found actually was that there is high negative predictive value if the DNA has resolved. Um, and there was an association with local regional failure in PFS, although I think the PFS would have to be significant because the numbers, given the excellent results of this trial, were very low. So we had very few disease events to work with. So again, um, if I had to point to a mega trend, I would say um, adaptation on therapy, whether through imaging, whether through biologic markers, um, for me, that is going to be uh, a huge next um, generation of, of research, and at least it had neck cancer. And this is a really cool paper from Japan. Um, it's a little bit hard to understand this, so I hope I explained this right, but basically what they looked at was that at um, every 10 gray of radiation therapy, how many of the patients had cleared their HPV DNA in the blood? And then they looked at the patients who had cleared the HPV DNA in their blood up to that point, and you'll notice that all the patients who had cleared their HPV DNA in the blood by the time of 40 gray, they had a failure-free survival rate of 100%. So that is really fascinating. It's a very small study that I think else has ever noticed. It's like 20-something patients, but this really points towards um, early response of that um, HPV DNA being important. And I will just add one of the findings that was very interesting to us from the HN002 post-hoc translation analysis that the patients who had concurrences platinum or cleared their DNA faster, right? So putting that whole story together, um, you can probably see where I'm going with this. Um, I'm really, really interested in the potential for um, better selection and uh, bringing dose escalation back with the potential for on-treatment dynamic adaptation. And I got that um, set of phrases from this really cool paper which is actually written about the recurrent metastatic space. When you think about how people work um, in, in, that, in that metastatic space, they're constantly assaying their patients. They're constantly on treatment. They're getting imaging. They're now getting CTDNA sometimes as well. And they're looking at all these factors while the patient's on treatment. They're changing the treatment in response to that treatment. And that actually has a real name, which is called dynamic response guided therapy. And the question is, um, why are we not doing that in radiation? So we are trying to move that direction at NRG. Um, one of the other biomarkers we have within NRG that is very unique and very important is EBV DNA. And we have two nasopharynx trials that are building off of experience in EBV DNA. This is um, the classic paper you have to know from the New England Journal of Medicine. You have to know this paper. 
which is that in Taiwan, they tested the EBV DNA at one week after completing radiation therapy. And so if you look at those bottom curves there, it is um, incredible difference in outcome. Uh, so, so that one test at, at one week after treatment really separates those patients out for, in terms of their risk. And so we took that forward and HN001 is based on that. So they get a post-treatment EBV DNA. And then we have two trials based on that. They have cleared their EBV DNA. The idea was we could drop standard adjuvant cisplatin 5 u like they did in l -Seraf. We drop that and randomize and see if um, dropping that is safe in those patients who've cleared. And then if they're still detectable, they get randomized between standard adjuvant versus um, a uh, non-cross-resistant uh, regimen of gemcitabine palpitase. So, um, you know, don't need to go into all this, but gemcitabine is really well known in nasopharynx cancer has shown better efficacy in the most static setting. So this is a non-cross-resistant regimen that may be better for those patients who remain at high risk. We just closed this study. It's a little bit sad, but it's also a little bit good. Um, sad because we didn't finish the study. We were, we were uh, several dozen patients short. Um, but the problem is that while we were running this study, and again, this goes to show you, you know, every trial is specific to its era, induction chemotherapy really became widespread within Asia. Um, I think within the U.S., which was mostly accruing to this trial, we, we, we were holdouts for a long time and we were, we were still accruing loads of the trial. But um, at, at this point, the accrual had slowed down so much that we were no longer contributing meaningfully to the endpoints, the statistics. Uh, by continuing to enroll. So we chose to go um, with uh, early closure, but we have um, enough patients in the bucket that I think we will get a, uh, a uh, meaningful interpretation. And then um, this is HN11, very different. So this is our current newly open, oh, well, I guess it hasn't activated yet. So it's just about to activate. In their current metastatic setting. So one of the thoughts here was, what do we have to contribute to nasopharynx cancer, given that you know the Asian countries have a really large population and have access to a lot of the same technologies and experimental regimens that we do. But one thing that we do have is um, uh, enhanced immunotherapy. So nivolumab and relapamab shown to be very effective in the melanoma setting, relapamab is a lag 3 inhibitor for those of you who follow immunotherapy. And so this is a current metastatic study where they get their upfront gemcitabine cisplatin for 6x, and then they go on to randomization of nivolumab maintenance versus nivolumab relapamab maintenance. And the point here is that we're also getting EBV DNA at the time that they randomize with the hope that we can make EBV DNA into a marker for which patients would go on to that enhanced immunotherapy versus those that stay on standard maintenance. Um, so it's a very, very early first step towards, you know, this this concept of dynamic on treatment therapy. Uh, okay, there we go. Okay, so I'm going to shift for a second and tell you about something that's I actually think is going to undermine all of this, <laughs> which is that. Um, HPV vaccination, as many of you know, was first recommended um, sort of in the late 2010s, and it initially started with relatively young age, and Garzville from Merle, which is, you know, all the high-risk types became a very favored form of this vaccination. And you may also know that you need to do a series, you need to do two or three of them, right? And the breakthrough that really came was when the FDA approved the expanded use of Gardasil to include individuals up to the age of 45 years old. Now, as we know, even if the FDA has approved a vaccine, and even if multiple studies around the world have shown efficacy in preventing cervical cancer, anal cancer, and now are studying prevention of head and neck cancer, nonetheless, many people do not want to be, uh, want, do not want to have their children or themselves vaccinated for various reasons. And so if you look at the uptake of HPV vaccination in this country, you can see it's extremely low and regionally very variant. Um, the darker blue have um, much better uptake, and then the lighter areas of the country have very low uptake. 
And then if you look at international comparisons, it's a little bit updated. I think it got a little bit better and then it got a little bit worse during COVID. But you know, Australia and the UK are just beating the pants off of everybody else, right? Now, we have to think about who is getting vaccinated. And we really saw that during COVID because what happened was during COVID, because of the difficulty in medical access, a lot of people stopped bringing their children to the doctor. And you have to finish the series of three shots for this to work. So many incomplete series, many patients who never saw the doctor or started the vaccination series, but who did start the vaccination series, those who had good access. And remember, we also have an age restriction in place. So this is a really fascinating article that again, I don't think a lot of people have paid enough attention to, but I think it is amazing. Um, this was um, uh, forecasting uh, based on immunization patterns and serum data, what will happen to HPV over the next two decades. And what you're gonna see is that um, it will decrease dramatically in this those who are vaccinated. So particularly below the age of 45, right? So guard still approval. But it will increase dramatically among those over the age of 70. Because those older adults um, who, who were not eligible for vaccination and were never vaccinated will remain at higher risk through their life, right? Because you get a second peak of infection. Remember that curve, that um, chart we looked at? get a second peak of infection somewhere around the age of 50 or 60. And there will be a demographic shift to excluded, we can call them excluded populations, we assume, right? Who, or at least those populations who had, for whatever reason, less access or less interest in medical care um, over the course of this vaccine rollout. And so, um, you know, I think this is interesting because when I say this, a lot of people get confused and don't know quite how to register this. This is what HPV will look like over the next coming decades. It will be the elderly and people who are traditionally excluded from uh, advanced or extensive medical care. And it will be really interesting to think about how all the paradigms, all the hoopla, all the attention, all the funding that we see right now for HPV could change. Um, be interested to hear some thoughts about that. I have my own cynical thoughts, but um, you know, to, uh, have to see how this research goes. And you know, I, 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 I've been bothered by this, and I think about this all the time. And when I, when something bothers me, or when something kind of lodges in a bad place, I have to ask myself why. Like, why is that bothering yourself so much? Bother me so much? And I would encourage all of you to think about that too, because when something doesn't sit right with you, or when something seems just doesn't make sense to you. That is a friction point that is an incredible jumping off point for discovery. And so for me, what this came down to was like, what are we gonna do for frail patients? What are we gonna do for elderly patients? And then I started thinking about all the elderly patients in the United States in the future, right? The, the demographics are changing and head and neck cancer treatment is super rigorous. So um, this is my little um, philosophical moment. Uh, my good friend, Leigh Choi at UCSF, she's the quality improvement officer, and she, she has this thing called the five whys. You have to ask yourself why, 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 why. And if you do this exercise, the fifth why has to lead to a place where you can make a change. Why, why, why? And sometimes the answers are strategic. Sometimes they're personal. Sometimes they're intellectual. But the goal is you find your why, and you articulate that why. And when you can, then you've discovered something. And I will say, in particular, this can be really, really powerful uh, for women. So I started thinking about frailty. And so in the NRG, we're now working on frailty as a major issue in chemotherapy eligibility. All of you know that, well, maybe you don't know, but we published an analysis of our TOG trials and we found that actually in the elderly population, chemotherapy is not benefiting and may even be um, detrimental in some aspects. And you all also know that when cisplatin is contraindicated, it's very controversial what you do with that patient many different standards of care, including carboplatin, uh, docetaxel, and then cetuximab, of course, is the FDA-approved alternative. And we are interested in this new class of drugs, which um, we're going back to basics here. We're leaving immunotherapy alone, and we're talking about DNA damage. Um, this is a, a, a class of drugs known as SMAC mimetics, or IAPs, which are inhibitors of inhibitors of apoptosis. 
um, and they work through a caspase-based mechanism and have been shown in head and neck cancer, both in um, uh, cell models and in vivo models to be very effective at uh, increasing response to radiation therapy. And I'll just show you this information very briefly. This was presented at ESMO as a blockbuster presentation where um, the survival was nearly doubled when zivinopant was added to a chemo radiation backbone. Have never seen a response with a drug like that added to a chemo radiation backbone. Not with cetuximab, which failed in 0522, not with immunotherapy, which failed in Javelin and Keno. So this is huge. And so we have this trial, which is, uh, if this comes through and launches soon, we'll be very excited. It's called Excelsior. And as you can see here, this is for chemo-free patients, cannot get cisplatin. They are randomized as being cisplatin eligible to cetuximab versus the on the front. And we could create a new standard of care with a more effective drug for these frail patients. And this is what I'm thinking, if we can get this to work out, um, this is our answer in the future for this cisplatin patient. So what's changing head and neck cancer practice? Well, you all know that HPV is out there. I showed you that staging now incorporates pathology. We have to deal with that discordance. There's a plethora of pathways now. We have to deal with that in terms of decision-making. There's a movement to reducing volumes as well as dose. It's gonna get very complicated there. On treatment, dynamic biomarkers are now in the clinic. I have to figure out how we actually make those effective and get some traction. Vaccination is changing the patterns of disease that we're gonna see in the very near future. And we have to think about what we're gonna do about the frail and elderly. And I'm totally open for questions. Where to start? That was fantastic. Covered so much chart. Well, before the questions come, I've always got the video going on this video. <laughs> In addition to the swag that you're wearing, <laughs> you're going to get more swag because this is. It works for both high beverages. This first one, we're all about the versatility here. Oh my gosh! Yeah, that's like that's like the Cadillac. It's <laughs> <laughs> black. Yeah. I appreciate you giving me the second annual Bruno lecture last year. Bob Turner gave the first, and we are so thrilled to have you. Thank you, Mr. Bruno. There you go. That's his last name, not his first. That is his last name. <laughs> Bobby. Um, we can mail this to you, uh, but you don't want to throw it away without looking because this is what you really want. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I don't think it has the initial questions. I can just throw it out there. Initially, you know, I just, <laughs> you go through all the information you're presenting there. I'm I'm often doing uh, a sort of history dump on the residents here. Mm. So I remember things from my training, occasionally triggers who never figure those things. And I realize that they're very unimportant. They're just going to go to the dustbin of uh, forgotten knowledge, and that's okay. Oh no, no, those are things you got to tell them. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> it shows that very interesting stuff about the potential adaptive use of Brazil was a senior. I'm after a good thing. Yes. And of course, he was my teacher. Okay, one of my teachers when I was a resident. He's he's got some mileage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was remembering if you said, well, what, what else are you going to do uh, to find out how things are going along the way? Because at that point in time, that 20 great points in time, there was a thing that we were always taught to look for. We tumoritis at the moment. Zach, we occasionally would adapt once in a while to the treatment of a head and neck cancer patient because we would think that it was around that two week frame of reference, frame of time, that um, you might get a little bit of extra. Population. Well, you get some inflammation that would come on top of it, and I, I will, I will have to ask Dave Rizzo at some point for if he's out there presenting his data on this. Well, you know, how do you think the PET scan was or was all that stuff you taught me so long ago? I just throw it away now because I don't know if this means anything to the. I mean, of course it's mine. Okay, so to say, just to say, we've been looking at this a little bit, and I, um, not to take away from your two-week theory, because I mean, there's a lot of important things that happen in two weeks, such as accelerated repopulation, which can be the bad thing um and, and and you know there i mean actually total digression i mean the history of concomitant boost is really interesting because the whole question was where do you put the concomitant boost and for those of you who know what concomitant boost is again lost art but i still do it um 
when I'm when I'm concerned and when we can't give chemo. Um, concomitant boost could go at the beginning, it could go at the middle, or it could go at the end. Very few people remember that. And the question was, where do you put it? And if you're countering accelerated population, actually, the concomitant boost maybe should be at least, but Anderson wanted to put it in, so do that. And oh, you, okay. <laughs> I'm a believer of the 10 critique of the Yes, yes, yes. That's 30. That's, Correct. That's two up. Correct. Just giving you the classic. Just giving you the classic. Here. Just giving you the classic. We're going to stay on the straight here. But anyway, um, we have looked at the two week time point because I agree with you. There's a lot of important things that are triggering around in there. And it doesn't seem, at least with the current tools we have, that two weeks works out. I think the four week is going to work out. So if I had to put my money down right now, I would say we're going to go all in on four weeks. And that's why I showed that Japanese paper. That's why I like it, because it proves my theory. <laughs> you you got to use what you have. Um, <laughs> use the tools available at the time. Um, yeah, so because it really shows that that four-week time point um, is kind of some kind of critical inflection point. And I, and I will say there's there's other data that backs up. Both. So, so you know, uh, the UNC data on CTDNA actually looks like there's there's importance of the four-week time point. So there's something about that time point that, that does, at least with the tools we have, possibly make it uh, a reasonable thing to initiate selection at the point. But this has to be worked out. Um, Got to figure it out. Complicated. It it may be it may be it may be how we how we install dose de-escalation for good. But think about it. Fair enough. Uh, anybody from the local audience with any questions? Because might be one online. Oh, is there? Okay, uh, I'll look for that. Um, I guess one question I have is I have a group of surgeons that likes to do surgery for HIV positive, mm -hmm. and they frequently say like, "Oh, you don't need to treat the primary site at all." And I wonder your thoughts on that yeah. based on the FDA Floyd trial. Yeah, I yeah. Know if there was pretty significant dose even there, unless they got protons. Correct. Adjuvantly, Correct. and then with ECOG, you know, thirty-three eleven, fifty gray. Well, again, uh, you know, this misunderstanding that you know. Dose is not a single line. Dose is yeah. a rainbow. Um, I, th I think that misunderstanding is so prevalent, um, even among our own community, where there's you know some some um, obsession about about a certain dose level, 60, 66, whatever. Um, and you know, I think part of the issue is communication. Like like, how are we going to communicate to people? It's very hard to communicate. What a rainbow looks like to someone, right? In in a relatively short words, without draining their enthusiasm, and and so you you know we have to figure out a way that we can somehow make that into a metric or a digestible piece of information that people can see, and maybe that is going to be you know actual interactive data. You know we could go into all kinds of things about like where I think publications are going and where you know human studies should be going in terms of like. Um, Flexibility of being able to look at data and interact with data in a different way, um, but but yeah, that's that's part of the misunderstanding there. And you're exactly right. That's exactly what I was going to bring up, which is that you know, have we actually not treated the primary site to zero? So Penn did, you know, to, in all fairness, Penn did the proton trial, and, and their doses are very very low to that area. Yeah. But you know, small trial, single arm, um, highly selected. Yeah. You know, this is part of the thing we're realizing. Is, is patient selection who actually enrolled on that trial is critical. And the unspoken universe of features that went into that trial outside of the state of collection, state of, state of inclusion criteria are really, really important. Um, because I can tell you right now, if I, um, for instance, well, I can tell you, you know, at our place when we, when we enroll patients on trials, we are looking very closely at how we think that's going to do, right? So there's there's unspoken bias just even in who can enroll into a trial. So the question, you know, how does something become practice? You go from the trial, which is kind of this very controlled environment where you've gone through enormous hurdles to establish a true effect, and then you go into dissemination and the community and the test of time. And that's where you start to see whether this is really working out. 
So I wouldn't say that a mission practice site has gone through all of that. Yeah, no, I agree. I always tell them that. <laughs> I mean, the other thing is, you know, uh, you know, are you making a difference? Un, un, unclear, unclear. Um, I mean, the one thing you can do is actually, you know, a, a very common practice now for tours, because they had so much bleeding and stuff like that, was that they don't like a um, lingual artery, right? And they um, they devascularize the entire pharynx. So then you come in, you've got a patient who's recently operated, maybe they didn't heal that well because they were old, start seeing that happen, who knows? Um, and you've devascularized the entire area, and now you're hitting them with, you know, radiation or potentially chemo radiation. That's that's the problem that we're going to have to work through too. And speaking of the frail population, I mean, should we be vaccinating beyond forty-five? Well, so that's why I showed you that thing, right? So very interesting. I mean, this is the thing, like sometimes you feel like people just are not communicating with each other. It's like the HPV scientists are not communicating with the vaccination people are not communicating with um, the cancer people. And, um, but, but there is a second peak of infection in the older age. Um, and so, um, yeah, a lot of my, it's, it's a very interesting question because a lot of patients who come back uh, and follow up asked me, well, should I be vaccinated now after my treatment? Will that prevent me from getting another cancer? I don't think it's going to prevent you from getting a cervical or anal cancer because that should have happened a long time ago. But would it prevent you from getting potentially another HPV head and neck cancer? It's it's possible, right? Because that second peak of infection is happening later and we're not vaccinating them. And so it's, you know, I don't know how to answer that because that's against the law. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, I say, you know what? Here's what I think, and use your doctor, and I'm not responsible for whatever you do with your primary care physician. Um, but you can pay for it yourself. Um, yeah, so you know, there's, and, and it's interesting. I've had patients actually go both ways on it. Um, that that particular issue, and the whole thing, you know, of course, with partners, too, right? Should you really get vaccinated? How long does your immunity actually last after a vaccination? We know that at some point that immunity is going to be. So these are again. Um, Knowledge gaps. Well, I think in the interest of time, we may close it down because we're going to have more conversations with people online. Okay. And uh, thank you one more time to the Rover team for helping us out to get this look organized and broadcast it and to help record it so that we can put it up on the YouTube network, the BBN network. Uh, and um, it was a terrific show, so much material. There's, there's, uh, so many things you're doing right now that are fascinating and that cancer is moving, moving quickly. I think it's very interesting and uh, the future's good. All right. Well, um, we'll close it up. Okay. Thanks, Nav, and everybody Hopefully else. Hopefully someone, someone out there is going to figure this stuff all out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you.